Now, young Republicans are creating organizations to speak out about climate change. As extreme weather events fueled by climate change affect more people around the world, a group of conservatives is trying to rally Republicans with a different approach. The American Conservation Coalition is targeting young Republicans who are concerned about the environment. The group wants to see more action on climate change. My name is Ben McClough, and I'm an ecologist interested in understanding how a changing climate impacts our planet. I believe that in order to make an impact on the environment, it's important to understand the perspectives, contributions, and leadership across the political and demographic spectrum. Join me for conversations that help us all understand the complex voices changing the way we think about climate change, conservation, and the modern environmental movement. The American environmental movement has deep roots in the Republican Party, and the American Conservation Coalition represents one of the most powerful leading voices in rediscovering an ethos of environmental protection from the political right. Founded in 2017 by Benji Backer, the ACC has led the charge towards a growing youth movement on the environment while maintaining traditional conservative values and perspectives. Joining me today is Carly Matthews, Communication Director with the American Conservation Coalition. Carly, thank you so much for chatting with us today. Could you start off by just telling us a little about yourself and how you got involved with the ACC? Sure, yeah, so I'm Carly Matthews. I'm the Communications Director at the American Conservation Coalition. Um, and I grew up in a really, really small town in South Central Pennsylvania. And um, there's more cows than people, um, very rural and agricultural. Um, so I knew I was conservative when I went to college. I went to college in Philadelphia, um, but it really bothered me that, you know, there wasn't a ton of discourse on the environment at the conservative clubs that I went to on campus. Um, so I was able to find ACC. It had been founded about um, a year before, and I got involved kind of as an intern and just kind of worked my way up in the communications department. Um, and I would say there's a lot of different environmental issues that I think hit home for me, but coming from a family of farmers on both sides of my family, um, also sportsmen and kind of general outdoorsmen, I think kind of getting back to conservation roots and, and remembering what we're fighting for is really important. And that's something that I try to make sure it kind of guides me through um, my job and my activism. Great. Well, thanks again for joining us today. Carly, can you explain exactly what the ACC is? How is it founded? And why is it unique compared to other environmental movements today? Yeah, I would say the American Conservation Coalition was founded to really give conservatives a voice on the environment and make sure they were re-engaged in the dialogue. Um, but we're really not a political organization. We're about actionable, common sense solutions that really anyone can get behind. Um, and we're really just kind of revolutionizing the environmental movement and we're really solutions oriented. So um, you don't have to be a conservative to support ACC, but you do have to support actionable solutions. You mentioned here, and your website also mentions that the ACC is not a political organization, but you do approach conservation issues through the lens of some traditionally conservative ideology. Is that, is that fair to say? Yeah, absolutely. So we are a nonprofit. Um, we were founded to give conservatives a voice on the environment. So we are guided by these conservative principles. Um, we have six principles that kind of guide us. Conservation, natural heritage, localism, capitalism, innovation, and balance. And I think I kind of want to expand on the last one because I think that's what makes our approach really unique is that we don't support, you know, a huge top-down government plan, even though it might be kind of comfortable to support a silver bullet solution and think, okay, if we enact this plan, climate change will be finished and everyone will be happy and it'll be fine. Um, instead, we you know really try to balance environmental protection, economic prosperity, um, you know, the ability of local areas to really decide for themselves what is the best way for them to conserve their environment rather than the federal government swooping in and telling them how to do that when it's their own backyard. Um, and I think that's what makes our approach unique and doesn't necessarily make it political in every sense of the word, but I, I agree it is guided by kind of traditionally conservative principles. I think from my own experience, a lot of the disconnect between what we think of today is the traditional climate movement and conservatives or conservative voices, conservative leadership, uh, is this idea that we often think of the need for a huge top-down government regulation as sort of really necessary to address the kinds of grand challenges that we're facing from a solution standpoint. 
how might this not be the only or potentially the best solution? Is Are there other sort of perspectives that the American Conservation Coalition or other groups like yourselves uh, might bring to the table? I think what's really important to kind of center the conversation is federal government action on climate change will be necessary. It's not realistic to say that, you know, we're going to um, realistically solve climate change without, you know, involvement from the highest level of government. That said, um, you know, the federal government often kind of trips over itself when it's trying to do good. Um, and, you know, the, the path is kind of paved with good intentions here. Um, and we see a lot of different examples of this in real time. For instance, nuclear energy is so expensive in part because of, you know, all the regulations and all the red tape that goes into building a nuclear reactor. Even when we're talking about small modular nuclear reactors, which are kind of this next generation of technology, um, the Nuclear Reg Regulatory Commission isn't really even equipped to be approving these permits because they're kind of used to, you know, our grandfather's nuclear um, rather than this new technology. So that adds another hurdle when nuclear energy could be, you know, really, really important for our clean energy transition. Um, another quick example I'll give is when we were talking about offshore wind, we run into so many hurdles with uh, NEPA, which is the National Environmental Policy Act, and even the Jones Act, which specifies which types of vessels can be in, in, certain, um, in certain areas in water. So it, it's Regulation can be a force for good, sure. We think about the Clean Air Act or the Clean Water Act. Those obviously had really important effects on you know, our natural environment. Um, you know, People used to have to wear masks for other reasons in Los Angeles because of the air quality, and we were able to clean that up. So that's really important. But there are other times where you know, government action is not good, um, and it kind of gets in, in innovators' way. You mentioned nuclear energy, which is somewhat of a hot button topic right now. I know ACC founder Benji Backer talks a lot about American energy and in particular nuclear energy as a solution to climate change and some other socioeconomic issues at the same time. Can you speak a little bit more to how the ACC views American energy independence as a tool for fighting global climate change? Absolutely. So I think what we're seeing in Ukraine right now is especially troubling to a lot of us at ACC, obviously because of loss of life. And this is, you know, horrific what the Ukrainian people are going through, but it's also really evident of what happens when we are dependent on really nefarious actors for energy. Um, Europe really um, went you know, full bore on an energy transition, Germany especially, um, and kind of rejected, Germany kind of rejected nuclear power in favor of wind and solar, um, which in theory may have been okay, but suddenly there was literally less wind in Germany, um, and Germany had to import natural gas from Russia, which has, you know, a lot more life, si life cycle greenhouse gas emissions than even American natural gas does. So by kind of bolstering Russia's economy by importing natural gas, we're kind of, you know, empowering this regime that obviously has very nefarious intentions in Europe. So I think that's what we're really kind of honing in here um, with the Ukrainian crisis, that we have to, as the United States, really be energy independent, produce clean energy here domestically. We're not only talking about fossil fuels, while that does have to be an important piece of the puzzle for now, um, but we should be really focusing on energy independence so that we're not relying on actors like Russia or China um, to power our homes. We often hear people say things like they're shouldn't be any politics when it comes to climate change and the environment is not a political issue. What do you think about room for sort of political discourse and political disagreement in the climate conversation while still coming to the conclusion that this is an issue we need to address with uh, some sense of urgency? I think when you're legislating around an issue, there are going to be politics involved. And, um, you know, we can agree in a bipartisan manner that climate change is a challenge and it's something that we need to address. But I think there should always be room for disagreement on solutions and, and what the best path forward is. Um, and I think that's kind of where the overall environmental conversation has gone wrong, right? Because it's, you know, as soon as you doubt something like the Green New Deal, it's like, oh, well, you're a climate denier when that's not true. You know, we can both agree that climate change is, is a problem without, you know, agreeing wholeheartedly on the solution. 
Speaking of uh, political disagreement, I don't think it's any secret that American politics have become pretty divided and, and bitter. And given sort of the environment of uh, politics today, how has your message been received among your own base? Yeah, so we recently did a poll and um, we found that 52% of young registered voters, so between the ages of 18 and 30, think that we can achieve environmental and economic balance, which essentially is ACC's message. So I think that really illustrates the fact that we've had really good reception, honestly, from both sides of the aisle. And of course, there are kind of the extremes. Um, I remember one Monday morning before 10 a.m., we were simultaneously called climate deniers and climate alarmists. So, you know, we do absolutely get criticism. Um, but I would say the vast majority of people, you know, really appreciate our approach and think that, you know, it. Again, like you were saying, this discourse around climate solutions is needed. There's not, you know, only one opinion that should be heard. Do you think those numbers represent a shift in the way the general GOP thinks about climate change or uh, is it more of a generational phenomena? Or I I guess, where do you see your message fitting in in the overall trajectory of a conservative politics today? So I think climate change overall has been a generational issue within the GOP for Quite a few years now, I think younger conservatives typically have prioritized the issue over their older counterparts, um, at least in the 21st century. Um, But I will say that I think there's an overall shift happening in the movement where we're kind of reclaiming our conservation roots. I mean, you know, Richard Nixon founded the EPA, George H.W. Bush signed those critical amendments to the Clean Air Act. Teddy Roosevelt was a Republican and he's kind of known as the founder of our national parks. So there is this conservation and environmental ethos that runs through the Republican Party. It just obviously kind of got lost for a couple decades. So I do think that there's kind of a reemergence of that. Um, We see Congressman Garrett Graves being the ranking member on the House Select Committee on Climate Crisis, um, doing some really important work there. Um, Congressman John Curtis founded the Conservative Climate Caucus last summer. Um, And even leader Kevin McCarthy introduced the Energy Innovation Agenda last Earth Day to show that, you know, conservatives really are engaged on this issue. Um, And the last thing I'll say here is I, I have a lot of hope and um, a lot of enthusiasm that if the GOP retakes congressional majorities in November, that there will be um, really solid plans for climate and the environment coming out of those those conferences. Yeah, you know, when you talk about a shift in thinking on climate, uh, obviously, the biggest challenge of communicating your message is climate denial and climate skepticism. and I think that's particularly dangerous in places like North Carolina's Outer Banks that are experiencing climate change in real time. And yet a lot of folks don't think of it as an issue that impacts their daily lives. How do you uh, address climate skepticism or think of climate denial when you're really trying to communicate your message to a demographic that might be a little bit more skeptical or, or just might be getting a different message from other folks in your party? Yeah, absolutely. I think climate denial um, or climate skepticism is absolutely still a challenge in the United States. Um, But I do think we're kind of rounding a corner where folks really are seeing effects of climate change and it's becoming more mainstream to really attribute them to climate change. Um, You see areas like Miami, um, you know, really experiencing that sea level rise and Republicans in the state of Florida, like Brian Mast, like Maria Salazar, um, they're really engaging on climate change at the congressional level and they're representing the folks, you know, back home by doing that. So I do think that there is a shift happening. Um, and I'd like to think that ACC and other groups kind of in the conservative environmental space have had something to do with that. But I really think it's about, you know, bringing these issues back home and, and making them really local and saying, you know, 20 years ago, were you experiencing floods like this? 20 years ago, were you experiencing these hurricanes and kind of showing the shift over time? Because I think it's really easy to say, like, we've always had hurricanes or, you know, this is just weather, but kind of showing a pattern over time and and showing the change, I think is really important to folks to kind of be able to reckon with that and and see, okay, you know, something's off here. Um, You know, this isn't, this isn't just weather. There's a pattern emerging. Um, So I think that's really important. Um, But I also just think a lot of times environmentalists kind of approach climate denial as like almost a disease and we we're very condescending or, you know, we're not 
pleasant when we're trying to talk to someone. Um, and that simply is not a good way to win over someone to your side. So it's something the ACC has really tried to do is kind of meet people where they are. You know, if they grew up as a farmer, we talk about agriculture and we talk about, you know, how farmers have been scapegoated for climate change and environmental degradation when you know they spend their whole lives out on the land and they have you know a great appreciation for nature and you know where they grow their crops so i think it's really about you know hearing what someone is actually saying instead of making assumptions about them um, and i think that's something that the environmental movement as a whole could really work on i completely agree i i think that's actually sort of the inspiration behind this podcast and, and listening to other perspectives on climate change is, is we really do need to meet people where they are and uh, and really hear what, what folks have to say. So I, I think really well said. Uh, at the very beginning of this conversation, you mentioned that uh, at one point you felt that there was a lack of representation in the environmental movement for conservative voices like yourself. And it sounds like that's changed uh, pretty dramatically over the last couple of years. Uh, what role models or, or movements can a young conservative person today passionate about the climate and the environment uh, look up to? So I previously mentioned Representative John Curtis, but he's been just absolutely incredible um, as far as getting more conservatives engaged, um, specifically in the House of Representatives on the issue of climate change. Um, and this past summer, he founded the Conservative Climate Caucus, which um, if you're not familiar with what a caucus is, um, it's basically kind of an interest group of legislators who come together to kind of talk about an idea, um, work on kind of educating each other on, on the topic. Um, and it's not so much policymaking, that's more of a committee in Congress. It's more of kind of, you know, workshopping ideas, educating each other, um, having discussions. Um, and that's been really, really important to get more conservatives comfortable with talking about climate change and understanding how to take this message back to their district that might be you know, a hub for fossil fuels or might be, you know, really agricultural and, and skeptical of, you know, what climate action will mean for that industry. So that's been really, really important. It's now the second largest caucus in the House of Representatives, which is kind of crazy to think about when, you know, you think about where conservatives were on climate, maybe even just five years ago. Um, so that's been really great to see his leadership. Um, outside of Congress, there's really kind of a growing ecosystem of nonprofits like ACC that, that work on this issue um, from Conserve America to Citizens for Responsible Energy Solutions to Clear Path um, to C3, um, C3 Solutions. There's really kind of this whole ecosystem of, of different organizations that tackle kind of conservative climate action or conservative environmentalism um, from different angles. ACC, of course, is kind of from the youth angle. So we represent young conservatives who want to see their leaders act on climate. Um, but there are kind of all different ways that, that conservatives can get engaged on this issue. You know, I'm embarrassed to admit that as someone who thinks about climate and the environment in my day-to-day -day life, uh, even I had no idea the magnitude of the movement and, and the perspectives that the Republican Party is bringing to the table on this issue. So um, I really think that speaks to the fact broadly that that there really is this stereotype uh, of the political right as an enemy on climate change. And, and if this, this conversation can lead to anything, I, I hope it sort of helps to begin to dispel that myth and, and bring some, some more voices to the table. So, uh, Carly, that's, that's all I have for you today. Uh, thanks so much for having this conversation. It's been incredible to hear all of the great work and energy that yourself and the ACC are bringing to the table. Uh, and I'm excited to see what you guys do in the future. Is uh, there anything you'd like to add before we, before we go? I don't think so. I think the only thing I'll say is um, to follow along with ACC, we're at ACC underscore national on Twitter and Instagram. And our website is acc.eco. The American Conservation Coalition has grown from its humble roots to a major movement in American politics that brings young conservatives back to the table on conservation and climate change. Their founder, Benji Backer, has appeared on countless news outlets to amplify his message that addressing a global climate crisis can be a powerful conservative principle. To date, the ACC has over 100 branches and continues to involve folks from all over the country to create a new approach to environmentalism. That's all today for our conversation with Carly Matthews and the ACC. Special thanks to her for taking the time to speak with me and also a special thanks to the Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center 
for helping to inspire and produce this conversation. Stay tuned for more thoughtful perspectives on conservation, climate change, and the modern environmental movement.